Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Markets and Morality, an eye show where we explore the differences between free market classical liberals. My name is Adam Bartha. I'm the director of Epicenter, a network of nine leading free market think tanks from across Europe. And today's episode is going to be slightly different format than usual. This time around, our guests don't have to make a binary choice between endorsing or disapproving a certain policy. Today, I will ask them to choose their least favorite taxes in the United Kingdom. I know, I know, I can already hear you say that you hate them all, but I'm sure that you hate some more than others. And choosing the level of disapproval on taxes is a bit like choosing which illness you dislike more. Some are clearly worse than others, but the ones that you least wish to get might not be the same as the ones that are the worst from a societal perspective. As you might know, today the five-year average tax burden in the UK is at a 70-year high, and the Conservative Party has been in government for over a decade, but there are no signs of tax relief coming anytime soon. So clearly, free marketeers have a lot to choose from when it comes to naming their least favorite tax. And for today's discussion, I'm delighted to be joined by two great free market thinkers who will choose their two least favorite taxes and outline why they are convinced that getting rid of them would lead to significant social benefits. First of all, a warm welcome to Daniela Buxel, who's the media campaign manager of the Taxpayers Alliance, which she joined last year. Previously, Danielle worked at the online magazine Unheard, making podcasts and videos as their audiovisual producer. Also a very warm welcome to Sam Dimitri, who's the research director of the Entrepreneurs Network. Prior to joining the Entrepreneurs Network, um, Sam has been a uh, research and head of projects at the Adam Smith Institute, where he specializes in policies relating to emerging technologies, the gig economy, and tax reform. Sam, Daniel, it's great to have you guys on board. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for having me. Daniel, I don't think I'm telling any secrets if I say that the Taxpayers Alliance has a rather firm stance on not increasing any types of taxes ever. But if you had a magic wand, what would be the number one tax that you would like to see completely abolished in the next budget? Oh, well, um, yeah, thank you for having me on the show. And um, it was interesting, your intro, you talked about um, we haven't had that many tax rises uh, in the last uh, tax cuts, sorry, in the last 10 years of Tory government. We actually did some research on that and we found that there's been over a thousand tax rises in the last 10 years under uh, Conservative uh, prime ministers. So um, yeah, we're definitely calling out for some for some tax cuts at the moment. Um, and yeah, the one that I would like to see um, would be business rates, uh, which is what I'm bringing to the table today. Uh, we did see some business rates uh, improvements in the budget uh, recently, but I don't think really really go far enough. I think business rates are a very distortive tax. They um, stop people from wanting to improve their businesses because the more they increase the value of their uh, premises, the more they get taxed on it. So it's a really, it's a disincentivizing um, a, a tax that really puts people off uh, improving their business. Uh, and, you know, we want people to be uh, starting businesses in this country. And the government goes on about, they want more investment, more more businesses, more productivity, all, all of those things. But a tax like business rates is something that actually disincentivizes people from going into business. And but I think particularly in my generation, uh, there's a lot of people out there that would like to start their own business, but that's the kind of thing that puts them off. So I think that's what we'd really like to see uh, going ahead um, as we sort of come out of COVID uh, and, and try and sort of rebuild the economy is encouraging people to start their own businesses and getting rid of business rates would be a good way to start. Thanks. Sam, same question to you. You're the next Rishi Shunat. You have a parliamentary majority of 100 MPs. What is the tax you're going to completely abolish? Well, I think I'm going to go for stamp duty. Uh, you know, if, if you are, if you, I think you ask most economists, they will say that the least efficient kind of tax is a transaction tax. It's because it's effectively voluntary. You only pay it when you sell. So you can just, so what it does is it forces people to stay in the same property for too long. But people's life circumstances change. You know, we, you know, people have kids, they get jobs in different places, they grow old, they move out and so on and so forth. 
But as a result, they're kind of stuck in these houses that are no longer suited to them. So it causes loads of harm in that way. And I think the Australian government did a review once and they found that, uh, so they, they, put, they put numbers to the sort of point of which taxes are the worst. And they found that for every one pound raised with a stamp duty style tax in Australia, 70p worth of wealth was destroyed in the process. That was, that was about four times more harmful than income tax, about eight times more harmful than VAT. So, I, so for me, that, that's my top priority. Sure. So let's assume that abolishing stamp duty was a massive, massive success. The public person is, is in a healthy shape and the population demands more tax cuts. What would be your second one on your wish list? For me, it's corporation tax, but I, I, it's, it's kind of take it tricky. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say abolish it, but rather I would reform it significantly so it would be a completely different kind of tax, what economists call a business cash flow tax. And I think, I think there's two big problems with, uh, with corporation tax. First of all, it's a tax on marginal investment. So if you're a business and you're making like an obviously profitable investment, then if you're taxed on your profits, it's probably not going to deter you. Then Apple are not going to not bring out the next iPhone because of corporation tax. However, if you're making a marginal investment, one of those investments that just about break even, and, and your concern is that, you know, to, 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 to part with your cash for a few years, because we all like to have money now rather than later, you need it to, 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 to get a return on that. And if corporation tax cuts that return, that investment just might not get made. And we there are lots of empirical studies that suggest that um, that, that effect of, on, on, on the tax system really, really negatively hits investment, which in turn never negatively hits growth. So while I was at the ASI, I wrote a paper called... A, we call it the factory tax effectively, because if you invest in new factories, and new machinery, and new technology, you effectively are penalised on that front. And so we, 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 we did a, we did an analysis looking at some of the empirical studies. And what we found was that um, if you were to eliminate that part of the corporation tax by saying that any business who invests in new capital can treat that like any other expense, which is kind of what they're doing with the super deduction now, although this is about making it permanent and not making it a subsidy or a tax, but just neutral, it would lead to 8% more investment and about a £2,200 late productivity boost, which in terms of wages, that's, that's, that, that's a pretty significant figure. So I, th I think that's really where, where I where I prioritize my, my future tax cuts from that point onwards. Some convincing arguments just, but before we dive into the details of corporate bait and reform or, or abolishment, um, Daniel, I would like to hear your second choice as well. What would be the number two tax that you would like to see abolished? Yeah, well, it's not really a tax that exists at the moment, but it's something that we've been talking about um, for uh, the past couple of years, I think, uh, the last year specifically um, since coronavirus. Uh, and that's the sort of online sales tax in many different forms, whether that's a sort of digital services tax or a delivery tax or something like that. But basically anything that um, impacts people, um, either buying or selling things online uh, and also various tech companies as well. So basically anything to do with with the internet and internet based businesses, which is one of the biggest growing uh, sectors in you know, our economy and, and the global economy as well. Sure. Um, interestingly enough, the public has somewhat different opinions than you two. Usually the top three most hated taxes are inheritance taxes, council taxes, and stamp duty that some did mention. Um, all of them that are chosen by the public are paid by individuals, whereas you have mentioned three taxes that are paid by businesses and one type of tax that are paid by individuals. So how come most of your choices are related rather to business taxation instead of taxes on individuals? Shall I, oh, sorry, I, I jump in first, but uh, I'll let you go, Sam. I was just going to say businesses don't pay taxes because businesses are ultimately a group of individuals. So, so any tax upon business has to go somewhere. So it can go to the consumers, it can go to the workers, it can go to the shareholders. But ultimately, someone has to pay. And so all taxes are really taxes on individuals. The reason that taxes on businesses are more popular than taxes on individuals is because the impact, the direct impact is obscured. You don't see those second, third order effects. Yeah, that's Manual, exactly, anything to add? That's exactly what I was going to say. You know, like the TV life, the TV that you have in your house, that doesn't pay the TV license, but uh, you still have to pay it yourself to watch the television. So, you know, to use a business, you still uh, might not be paying a tax directly, but 
they as, as in the business might not, itself might not be paying that tax but other people are so you know wh whoever get feels it at the end it, it impacts our society it impacts our growth um our productivity and all the things that we want to have a healthy and, and growing economy sure um danny i would also like to dive into the business rates a bit mm -hmm. more deeply um because land value taxes are actually quite popular in some free market circles. And business rates are partially a tax also on the value of the land that the business sits on. So do you think that business rates should be completely abolished or do you actually see a way that it can be reformed so they turn into some sort of land value tax that economists and free marketeers tend to like a bit more? Yeah, so it's quite an interesting one. I think that land value tax uh, was actually proposed by the Lib Dems in 2018, uh, and they did a, a sort of report on on what they would like to see. And it was very similar. They want to abolish business rates uh, and replace it with a sort of land value um, tax. But um, from a sort of personal point of view, I think it, that, that's not really sort of, you're not really fixing the main problem there. And the main issue is that, you know, uh, businesses have to pay rents if they don't own the property itself, which most businesses, uh, particularly on high streets and things like that, they don't actually own the buildings. Um, but so they have to pay their rents and they also have to pay the rates. So you're getting rid of the rates, but you're effectively then moving that onto the landowner who's then going to put it on the rent. So the businesses will have to pay it one way or another. So I don't really think that's sort of cha making a challenge on the actual problem there, which is that the fundamental truth is that the tax on businesses is too high. So if we then move it onto the landowners, they're going to get um, that offset onto um, the businesses anyway. So they'll still be paying it one way or another. Uh, and then the other sort of problem with uh, that idea, I think, is the way that you value land is very difficult. You know, when you have a house, part of the reason that you can value the house is because of where it is, what's nearby it, you know, is it near a train station, a school? Uh, it's the same thing for a business. Is that business near other businesses? If it's, you know, in the West End, it's near other sort of entertainment, uh, restaurants, all that kind of thing. So that might be a reason that it's, it's worth more than, you know, say something in the suburbs uh, that you have to drive a long way to. So it, it's, it would be quite difficult to work out what the true value of the land is rather than just the the sort of like surroundings as well. And I think the amount of bureaucracy that that would entail, you know, businesses already have to do so much red tape at the moment um, that, that, that that wouldn't really impro improve the, the, the lives of many business people in the country. So it's easier to get rid of it completely rather than reform. Yes, I think the, 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 the ideal is that we have a simpler tax system. Um, I've seen some people say that, you know, obviously it's a very big money spinner. Um, and the way to sort of improve it is to get rid of it, not have this sort of like land value tax um, system, but use the um, VAT system to um, in increase the revenue for the treasury, which is a simpler way of doing it. So, you know, it does, it does make it more efficient um, and it makes it more, e more easy for the business to say, oh, yes, well, that's going there, that's going there. There's less, less sort of accounting dilemmas there so it makes it easier for them but at the end of the day that also does impact the consumer and the consumer is facing you know a 70 year high tax burden as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show so you know it's a difficult one we just yeah want to see taxes cut across the board really sure sam you have mentioned stamp duty as your number one tax that you would like to get rid of and there you seem to be agreeing with the public quite a bit because the public usually chooses in their top three as well. Um, and I'm sure you know that even during the pandemic, property prices were continuing to grow and they, they seem to be at an all time high nowadays. Um, partially, some people were blaming the temporary lift on paying tax stamp duty uh, for that continued growth of property prices. Are you not a bit worried that abolishing stamp duty would just benefit current homeowners and would not really have an impact on first time buyers who are already exempt of paying stamp duty? So I think you're right to say that the benefits will mostly flow to homeowners initially. However, um, I think everyone is harmed by stamp duty, including non homeowners. When you have to think, you have to think about the long term harm. So if you reduce moving rates, what that means is people are stuck in houses that are not suited to them. Think of the old lady that's in the house that's way too big for her now that her kids have moved out, her husband's no longer there, and she actually wants to move into a care home, but she doesn't want to be hit with this massive stamp duty bill. Now, she's probably not going to sell to a first-time buyer. She might be selling to a third-time buyer. 
But that third time buyer might be moving out of a house, which is they're then going to sell to a first time buyer. So even gumming it up near the top can create problems near the bottom. And you've also got to think of the other harms of stamp duty. So if people are moving less, people aren't uh, spending on things like uh, home renovations, home improvements. So one of the things we know is that not, not in the most previous case, because we didn't really, we weren't really allowed to do much uh, last year. But in general, when there's stamp duty cuts, you see a, you see a pickup in lots of uh, building work. And you see a pickup in sort of you, people buying new sets of furniture, new things like that. So it, so it not, has knock-on effects across the economy. It's also got a productivity impact. If you're not in the right place uh, where the best job is, then you're going to be harmed if you can't, if you can't, if you can no longer move to that location. And as a result, if you don't make that move, then you're going to be you're going to miss out on working in the best possible job. And that means productivity is going to decline across the economy. That means less stuff is being produced. That means it makes us all worse off. So there's lots of ways where it can where it can harm you. But you are right to say that the benefits, a lot of the benefits will be captured by land landowners. And I think that's in generally a problem uh, if you with with property taxes, there's that. Uh, if you cut them, the, the benefits will go to land, la, um, the landlord or the property owner, because the supply of property is very, very tight. Now, if we had a really reformed planning system, you might see the, those benefits becoming a bit more diffuse. But when when the number of houses effectively capped at a certain level, you know, we, we can't really build more, we can't really build enough to, to meet demand at the moment due to planning regulations. Then a lot of those benefits go to go to homeowners, and so that that, that, that is a problem. So that's why. I, I favour replacing stamp duty with something like a uh, something like a proportional property tax with a bunch of protections baked in. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a it's a key it's it's a reasonable concern. Sure, that makes sense. Um, moving to your second choice, Sam, you mentioned corporate tax as the second one that you would like to get rid of, where you seem to be going against the tight guys quite a bit because there is a lot of discussions nowadays in developed countries about. Um, harmonizing corporate tax rates and setting minimum rates. Um, you know that there is an OECD proposal, um, which might be the first step in this direction. Do you think that there is any scope to maintain international tax competition? And if so, can or should the UK government actively try to encourage it? Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a really interesting question. So, so my concern with corporation tax is mostly around the base, how the tax is actually designed. So my key concern is first that we, we don't treat all types of spending equally. We do, spending on long-term investments is taxed at a higher rate than spending on short-term spent, you know, buying pens, paper, staplers or whatever. Um, and so that's my first concern. My second concern is that we it's not symmetrical as a tax. So uh, you're taxed on the upside, but you're not subsidized on the downside. So as a result, if you're taking a risk, uh, a higher tax rate is going to burden you. So if you can fix those things, and there is a way of doing that by turning into a business cash flow tax, where you're effectively taxed on your free cash flow rather than uh, what, what's defined as corporate profits for corporation tax. So I think that that would solve the problem. Now, if there was tax competition on that front, it's probably not the most like valuable form of tax competition. I'd rather tax competition in that case then starts to take place and things like income tax and things like that rather than business taxes. But if you've got a situation where you're not going to fix uh, the, these like underlying problems with the way corporation tax is designed, then any anything away from any sort of reduction in tax competition is probably going to lead to less investment uh, and less international investment too. But there was a proposal by um, economists recently who used to work for uh, George W. Bush uh, and he, he had an article in the Financial Times. And he, his suggestion was, let, let's sort of um, come to a compromise. We can have a global minimum, minimum corporate tax, but let's define the base as uh, a cash flow tax. And what that will do is that will shift everyone who doesn't have a cash flow tax at the moment. That will mean that the, each time they, they try and become more competitive as a tax system, their first priority is going to be moving to full expensing. It's going to be uh, making sure loss carry forwards are properly designed so that uh, if, you, if you lose money uh, in one year, you can write that off against your losses in a future year with, a, with an interest factor adjusted. If you can fix those things, then it can be, re re it can be actually a, a really positive form of tax competition while removing some of the negatives because we don't really want businesses to move from somewhere where they're perhaps most productive to the country with the best tax system, but maybe not the best land or the best workers. 
So I think I think they're right to think about tax competition, but they're wrong to think about corporation tax as as something you completely want to eliminate tax competition. Really, you want to really eliminate some forms of corporate tax competition. And do you see any hope that? these kind of ideas that you have outlined are gaining traction or do you think that the way the OECD is conducting these negotiations at the moment is going down the wrong path? It's an interesting question. So I think there's there's one way of doing it where essentially you shift corporation tax to something that looks at sales in a way that's similar to VAT. This was a proposal that Donald Trump was considering. Uh, Paul Ryan came up with the idea kind of. Uh, that, and there were economists at Oxford came up with it. Then Paul Ryan saw it. Then it nearly was in Donald Trump's tax plan originally, but got, but got dropped at the last minute. So that's one way of doing things. And actually, some of the negotiations at the OECD hint towards that kind of system emerging in the years to come. Another way of doing it is is company is countries might say, look, we're happy to raise our minimum tax rates, but we want to define the base in a certain way. And there are there are good ways and bad ways of doing this. So one of the bad ways is what we do at the moment, which is called uh, the patent box. So if you have a patentable innovation, you pay a different corporate tax rate. Now, if you want to eliminate complexity and uh, not try and pick winners in the economy, you wouldn't tax patentable innovations at a lower rate than non-patentable innovations. In fact, the economic case for taxing patentable innovations is probably weaker because at the end of the day, if you've got a patent, that gives you that's kind of the incentive for doing that kind of innovation in the first place. So I think I think there'll be debates over the base, and I can see the future of competition being based around the tax base rather than tax rates. But the question is, can we define what we want that tax-based competition to look like? And I think that's something politicians haven't really thought about. But if you if you're Rishi and you've got the super deduction. Uh, you don't want to accidentally uh, rule out your flagship corporate tax policy when you define what the right base for, for international taxation is. Sure. Um, this is a question to both of you, but I would like Daniel to address it first. Um, Daniel, you have mentioned that you would like to get rid of business rates and business rates account for a 24 billion pounds income or roughly 3% of the annual budget of the UK. Um, how would you replace the lost income to the treasury if you abolished business rates? Or do you in general prefer to cut spending instead? And if so, in which areas? And of course, this question is applicable to any sort of tax cuts in general. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really a question of either or necessarily. Um, I think that's a very sort of like a blinkered view of looking at how the economy and taxation and how the treasury uh, generates its income um, and I think, you know, we've sort of lost this idea that when you when you cut taxes, it can actually be a net positive for the Treasury because it, it creates economic growth, it creates productivity. Uh, and when people have more money in their back pockets, they end up spending it elsewhere. So that, you know, goes to um, if you're a business, for example, you might end up hiring a new employee or you might um, expand your shop front or, you know, make your premises more attractive. And that all contributes to the economy at the end of the day, which in turn generates an income for the Treasury. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that cutting taxes is going to be a, a net loss for the Treasury at the end of the day. And, you, you know, you've got to look at these things from a, a long term perspective as well. Um, but in terms of the, the sort of Addressing the question more directly, when we do um, propose tax cuts at the CPA, we also um, suggest areas of spending um, that, that, that or savings that you could um, that you could uh, you, you could you could use to then offset that. So um, a lot of the time, that's wasteful spending, whether is you know whether that's um, biscuits um, spent in the civil service or something like that. Um, but we we did produce um, a document last year or 15 areas of savings that the government could make. And that generated uh, 40 billion pounds of saving this year. And it continues, it would continue to deliver savings of, I think it was 70, 73 billion pounds by 2025 uh, to 2026. Um, and that's just things like making, uh, capping annual leave. So civil servants have um, a similar annual leave entitlement to the private sector. Um, things like uh, moving government departments outside of Whitehall, so they're in more cheaper um, office spaces. Um, things like um, cutting the um, 
uh, or sorry, raising the pension age to 68 uh, sooner than is planned. So that also um, saves some money as well. Um, but there's, yeah, there's loads of places that the government can save money and they're all like very simple tweaks um, that they could make if they, if they really wanted to, to, to Im improve the economy by, by putting these tax cuts forward. Sam, do you agree with Daniel? Does it mean, you know, tax cuts, do they lead to higher income for the treasury or do we need to find significant um, cuts um, in spending? I mean, I think it, it, it's a matter of magnitudes and specifics, I think. But in, in general, it's, it's clear that economic growth has a really, really important impact on the public purse. So if, you're, if you ask me, how, how do I fund uh the sort of top tax cuts on my wish list, I'd probably say, look at planning reform. If you, uh, my, my, my former colleague, uh, Ben Southwood, did some analysis for Create Streets, where he looked at uh, the policy of street votes, the idea of getting more people to be able to vote up so they can build an extra story on top of their roof. He looked at the economic growth potential for that policy, both in terms of more building and construction, but also in terms of better uh, distribution of workers around the country so people are working in their most productive roles. He, I think he found some like a doing putting that policy in place would raise um, would 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 create an extra ten billion pounds uh, of revenue for the exchequer if you just look at all the other taxes that might go up in the process. So I think that is one way of funding some of these cuts. Obviously, when you cut corporation tax, if you cut it in the way I've suggested doing it. Uh, by looking at full, by looking at something like full expensive, that will lead to more investment. That investment both will increase VAT receipts. It will also increase workers' wages, and those workers' wages will ultimately uh, be, be, be become income tax receipts. So, so the actual fiscal impact of these taxes, um, cutting them, is probably going to be lower than you think. But at the same time, I don't think we should assume that all tax cuts always uh, raise revenue. I think that that's unrealistic. Uh, and in that case, we do need to talk about spending and look at um, where spending is wasteful, and where spending is kind of not not clearly tied to to an objective. Where you know you you kind of you see this every kind of budget where where, where it, it doesn't really feel like the spending is strategic. It's rather that okay, I've I've done this so I can say that this constituency is re receiving two million pounds, and I can make a joke about uh, the I think. What was it saying? The, the Bayou tapestry was like one that I, one, one that I remember. There was a the classic case was a, George Osborne did a special tax cut just for films, I and mean, he did it basically to make a Star Wars joke budget. Uh, slightly more strategic thinking on spending and some of the sort of inefficient tax rates is a pretty good way, I think, of uh, funding the more strategic, more valuable tax cuts. Well, I do hope for the sake of the British economy that many of your ideas, Sam and Daniel, are going to be realized in the next budget. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for all your insights and for the whole discussion. And to our dear viewers, thank you very much for joining us as well. I hope you have enjoyed the discussion just as much as I did. And if you did, then make sure to follow I London on Twitter and hit the subscribe button just below this video. Also, a special thanks to our donors, without whom the work at the eye that we're doing would not be possible. If you wish to become one of those donors and contribute to our work, please do consider subscribing to our IA Patreon account, where you can receive some of the exclusive content and also have a sneak peek into some of the behind the scenes discussions, if you would like. But for now, thanks a lot for joining us, and I hope you will join us in two weeks' time again. Yeah.